Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> this time of year, when we've just observed that festival which points toward the return of Christ, and we were thinking about one that's coming up very shortly, which has to do with the time when the whole world would be made at one with God, it's time to ponder over these things. And I, you know, when I, as a minister, I get to speak on these days many times, and I always, when I come to the holy day season, spend a great deal of time in reflection and thought about what it means. I don't know what it was, but something in this year caused me to start thinking about what it would mean to really be at one with God. What would it be like to be at one with God? Now, in the, the, the Jews in their holy days will oftentimes uh, take a scripture straight out of Deuteronomy 6, 5. They speak it in Hebrew, and it means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Not three, not two, one. Now, of course, for Christians nowadays, or already for the last 2,000 years, they have held, many of them, a thing called the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is the idea that God exists in three persons which are somehow one and the same at the same time. The doctrine of Trinity is generally recognized as you start researching it as non-existent in the Old Testament, un completely unknown, and unstated in the New Testament. The fact is that the doctrine really uh, grows out of an attempt on the part of theologians to reconcile the Old Testament concept of one God with the New Testament concept of God the Father, God the Son, and as they see it, God the Holy Spirit, which they see the God as existing in three persons. And in one sense of the word, I know when I first began listening to the World Tomorrow program, to Mr. Ted Armstrong and to his father back in 1958, and began to hear some of the things that they were saying about the Godhead, what struck me first was, are we monotheistic or are we polytheistic? Do we believe there is one God, or do we believe that there can be more than one God? And you can imagine my consternation when I heard Herbert Armstrong say that we can become God. Uh, this was rather disquieting. It seemed to hack away at the foundations of, of what I perceived as a, an absolutely unchallenged concept that God was one. That he was, there was, I was a monotheist. I was not a polytheist. I didn't believe in, in one God or two gods and three gods and, and several gods in heaven throwing lightning bolts at each other in the manner of, the, of many of the Greek religions, and I couldn't quite get my mind around this concept of one God or more than one God. This concept of being at one with God lies right next to the doctrine of the Trinity and its concepts the doctrine of the nature of God, and whether or not you and I can be at one with God. In John, the first chapter, John chooses to begin his gospel with the words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that's a tough concept. How can you be with something and be that same thing that you are with. You know, I went uh, over yesterday to Alabama to conduct the funeral, and people went with me. And we were in the same airplane. I was with them, and they were with me, and we were together in that sense. But we were not the same people. You know, I am with my wife when we travel, but I am not my wife. Now, the choice of the words here, the word was with God and was God, it's something you can't just skate over. You can't just, you know, fly right by that. Now, I know, I understand fully the concept that God is the family name and that we can bear family name and that, you know, the son is God, the father is God. My father's name was Dart. My name is Dart. We are both Dart, but we are still two separate individuals. But I think we have to realize that there is more to this than merely the kind of a family relationship that you and I consider. My wife and I are, in a human sense, one. But we are not one in the sense that Jesus and the Father are one. This is more than just a mere uh, uh, two people who like one another or who get along well or who think alike. We are told that the Word, which was Jesus Christ, was with God 
and was God, and of course was the agent of creation. Now I want you to turn back a few pages in John. A surprising amount of a degree of this or concept of this concept is found in the book of John. In the tenth chapter of John, beginning in verse twenty two, it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said to him, How long are you going to make us doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, for you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. He presents the Father as an other who gave these people to him, one giving to another. And so here we have a concept of the Father and an other, which is the Son. But he continues. He says, My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's house, hand, my father's hand. I and my father are one, not two, but one. Now we, you know, you and I would say, well, how can that be? It's impossible. But of course, in a human sense, we tend to think in terms of one and the other. We tend to think in terms of the separation between human beings that is occasioned by uh, all of what is me is enclosed by my skin, and all of what is you is enclosed by your skin, and that your brain is inside of your skull, and my brain is inside of my skull, and we think totally in human terms. Do you suppose it's possible that when you start moving into the spirit world that things aren't quite that way? And that maybe the relationships that exist there can even be closer than anything you and I can imagine? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Many, he said, Many good works have I showed to you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. They understood what he was saying when he said, I and the Father are one. He was saying, I am God. And they were, to, they were going to stone him. Jesus said, Isn't it written in your law, I said, You are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and they were people just like you people, and they were addressed as gods. He said, if he, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, why would you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you believe not me, not me Believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Now, there is another thing that we would have difficulty with. It's not too hard for me to explain to you how the Holy Spirit is in you, or how Christ is in you. This is a, a concept that's preached by every preacher in the land who is a Christian and teaches basic Christian theology. The idea of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is not difficult. The idea of being impregnated with God's Holy Spirit is not difficult. But here we have a statement where he says, The Father is in me, and I am in him. Once again, a, an implication of a closeness in the relationship that is a little foreign to you and I. It seems as though laws that are, you know, our way of thinking, our way of conceiving of things is inadequate to deal with what we are seeing here. Now, of course, God reveals himself to us in terms of a family. There is a father and there is a son. There is no indication in the Bible of any mother in this family, though, so the analogy isn't quite like the human family. But he presents it to us as father and his son, and we are told that we are to relate to him as a father. And so we are able to grapple with the idea of God in terms of the family. But I think it's important for us to realize our limitations and to realize that when God reveals something to us in terms that we are able to deal with and respond to and live by at a given point in time, that doesn't mean that we now know all there is to know about God, and that we may not encounter some contradictions in what we perceive to be God and the way God is and the way we relate to him. And then there is this sobering thought that comes along. Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and we look forward to a time when we will be at one with God, what does that mean? 
What does that mean? How will we relate to that? Well, he continued to explain these things to these men. They sought again to take him, and he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan. They just could not deal with what he was trying to tell them. In the 14th chapter of John, Jesus says more about this. This is that part that we read every year at the Passover. And he says some very profound things in this chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now, Thomas sitting there was not entirely satisfied by that. And he would be like a lot of us. If we heard that, he'd say, wait a minute, he, I know the way. Uh, you know, he wasn't quite clear. He wasn't sure that he did. He, he didn't really feel he had his mind around it. And he said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father. Striking thing to say. Now, I like Thomas because Thomas was, was really a very honest man. He wasn't one of those people that pretended to believe what he didn't believe. He wasn't one of those people that would sit there whenever, whenever uh, you're trying to tell him something he doesn't understand and nod his head as though he did understand it and as though he agreed with you totally. If Thomas didn't understand, he would ask. And he wasn't sure, and he didn't grasp it. And when they told him about Jesus, he said, well, look, I've been around with you guys a long time, and I don't know that I can always depend on you to tell me the truth. I want to put my, my finger in his palm and my hand in his side. This is an honest man talking, weak, maybe lacking in faith, maybe, but honest. But Jesus explained to him, if you had known me, apparently saying to him, you haven't really known me like you might have, you would have known my father also. And from henceforth, from now on, from this day forward, you know him and have seen him. Now, wait a minute. Here we are all sitting around thinking in terms of here's the son, son of God. And the father, that who is God, is, is in heaven. And here we are down here and there is Jesus. And we hope someday to see the father. And Jesus said, from henceforth, you know him and you've seen him. Philip speaks up, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be enough. And Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, how are we supposed to take that? Are we to take that in the sense that I would try to tell someone, Oh, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. You know, we look alike. But you see... My father and I really aren't that alike. Is there absolutely no distinction whatever between Jesus and the Father? Is seeing Jesus in the flesh, is that like seeing the Father in the Spirit? I, you know, there are some, some questions here that, that we will probably not have answered until Christ returns and we're able to sit at his feet. And, and then when we have some, a little more capacity than we have now, I think we can understand them. But he looked at them, and they looked at him, and he said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, then how are you going to sit here and say, show us the Father? Believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? You don't believe this. I've told you. You don't believe it. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father who dwells in me. He do, does the works. Ah, so it is the Father was in him. And you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You have seen all you need to know about the Father in seeing Jesus. But once again, he seems to be telling us something a little beyond what we are able to deal with, that he and the Father were one. Well, how is it possible then for him to be the Father and us to see him as the Father and him to pray to the Father which is in heaven? Once again, we deal with a contradiction in human terms, but apparently no contradiction at all in his terms. He said, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, if you can't deal with that, well, at least believe me for the work's sakes. You've seen what I've done. You know who I am. At least believe me for that reason. Verily I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, 
and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Who will do it? I will do it. But you notice you're asking of the Father in his name. Once again, there is a, a closeness here. But there's something else that happened in this discussion that can slip by you if you don't think about it for a moment. Jesus is talking to these men about, not only about Jesus being in the Father and the Father being in him. He is talking about Jesus and the Father being in the disciples. He was going to be in them. And these men, these 12 men that were seated with him at this time at this dinner, these 11 really, I guess, by this time that were there, were told that they were going to, in a sense, become at one with God. There was a unity. There was a joining with God that was going to take place at some level, at some degree. Do you see what this is saying to us and what we begin to pick up a little bit on the side? Jesus is at one with God. And being at one with God means that Jesus shares all of the power of the Father. He will say, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Whatever power God had, he had put in Christ, or he shared it with Christ, or they shared it together because they were one. If then you and I are at one with Christ and at one with God, there is a sharing of power that's involved in that. And he says here, you will do greater works than these things that I have been doing here because I am going to my Father. So the power that was in Christ was going to be shared with others who were going to be at one with Him. Being at one with God means power. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. See the joining that is taking place. I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, which means that we are also in the Father. At one with the Father. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. And I will manifest, I'll manifest myself to him. I'll show myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not to the world? How are we going to see you in the world as not? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him. Now, let's think of that through. If a man loves me, who loves Jesus, and who keeps his words, does what Jesus said, he said, my father will love him, and we will come to him. Wherever you are, you know, I don't care where you are. If you're in a black hole of Calcutta, you know, if you live up in New York or New Jersey or down in San Diego or San Antonio or up in Bemidji, Minnesota, wherever you are, it says, God, we, both of us, will come to him and will make our abode with him. We will live with him. There is a joining that takes place at a certain level to a certain degree between a human being walking around on two legs out of weak eye with his weak eyes looking out the world and his, his failing hearing. There is a joining between man and God that can take place now. It takes place through repentance, through baptism, the receiving of God's Holy Spirit, and through the love of Christ and obedience to him, and keeping his words. God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son will love him, and they too who are one will live in you and with you. It's basically a, 
a combining of man and God that takes place at baptism and when a person receives the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on to develop his theme a little further. He said, He that loves me not does not keep my sayings. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You know, we, we take a great deal of, of pleasure, we human beings do, in our independence. We take a great deal of satisfaction in being, you know, me, our identity, uh, my, myself. I am Ronald Dart. I am not somebody else. I am unique in all the universe, and my fingerprints are unlike anybody else's. Uh, you know, I have blue eyes, and I have, you know, uh, brown hair, and I, I'm, I am me, and I am different. And I don't like for people to tell me what to do. And I have my opinions, and you have my, yours, and they are somewhat at variance with one another. And here we are asking a human being, with all of his independence, with all of his desire to be uh, apart from, separate from, independent, and we're asking him to become one with another mind. Do you have any idea how much of your mind you've got to give up to be like God? For your mind to be like God's mind? For your will to be like His will? How many things have to change inside of you for you to be at one with God. Did you think that was going to be some kind of a just magical snapping of the fingers that all of a sudden, you know, Christ comes back and the trumpet sounds and you're at one with God, that, that, that you would be at one with God and there wouldn't be anything different going on? Now, you know that if that happened today, there would have to be certain changes made inside of you for you to be at one with God, don't you? There would have to be things that would fall away. There would have to be ideas and concepts that would have to be abandoned, that would no longer exist in your mind because they've been brought into the presence of pure truth. Pure truth. You know that would have to go. Then you understand that there is some change involved. There is some loss involved. There is some giving up involved in beginning to merge your mind with the mind of God. He goes on to tell them about this Holy Spirit. He said, He that loves me not keeps not my saying. The word that I speak is not, that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus himself says, My message is not an independent one. It is that which I got from the Father. These things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And indeed, a person who is at one with God has nothing to fear. No reason to be afraid, no reason to be afraid of the dark, no reason to be afraid of enemies, no reason to be afraid of truth, no reason to be afraid of new concepts or a different idea from anything you held, no reason to be afraid at all when you are at one with God. You have heard how I said to you, I go away and I come again to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. But I've told you, before it comes to pass, that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let's go hence. And then in chapter 15 he continues, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now all we have here is a little analogy. And analogies are, by their very nature, faulty. They never quite tell you the whole thing. But it may be in this analogy we can begin to understand a little bit of what is involved with, some, with, with two others that can be one. For indeed, you know, as a grapevine begins to develop and run up, let's say, along the little wires that they lay out for them and maybe work its way down a fence post, we have way down here on the end a twig that has a leaf on the end of it, maybe a, a little sprig that comes out, and grapes begin to grow down here. And then over here, maybe several feet down the fence, comes another little runner out and comes another little cluster of grapes that begin to develop over on this end from maybe below some leaves and along a branch. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Now that's a beautiful little analogy. Is the branch, is this you know, a twig over here that's producing grapes and has leaves all around on it with all of the, the little chemical factory that's producing the sugar and bringing it up through the roots and putting it out there, is this different from 
Is it separate from, is it an other from this branch over here? Certainly. Certainly it is. But is it one with it? Oh, sure. If you get down to the roots and cut off the base of this plant, it all dies. It all dies. Because they are a part of the same system. All a part of the same plant. And it may be that in understanding this is one way we can understand how it's possible for two to be one, to be part in the same. As I say, it's a little bit foreign to us and to our manner of thought, but it is something that we're going to have to come to, probably. I mean, I'm quite sure whenever Christ returns and we begin to understand truly what God is doing. N now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. I want you to remain in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it remain in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. That union with Christ that takes place at baptism, that receiving of God's Holy Spirit, that entering into God and God entering into you is absolutely the fundamental. I mean, it's the one thing you cannot do without. You cannot survive without it. Cut off from Christ. Cut off from God. Separated from God, you will die. And so he tells you, you've got to remain in the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that remains in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. Now you see, being at one with God has to do with power. Because he could continue to say in verse 7, If you abide in me, and if my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done to you. This is the kind of power that goes along with being at one with God. Turn back, if you would, now to the fifth chapter of John, where Jesus made a rather simple statement, but a profound one. In John, the fifth chapter, in verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father works hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only had broken the Sabbath day by their reckoning, but had said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Now that's interesting. You know, first of all, he is told us back in the 15th chapter of John, without me, you can do nothing. You'll be absolutely helpless. You can't go out and accomplish great things for God. All these greater works that I, than what I have done that you're supposed to do will not happen unless you remain in me. Then he turns around and says, I can do nothing of myself. The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For what things soever he does, these does the son likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son can make, give life to, can raise from the dead, whoever he will. It was at Jesus' will. He could raise anybody he wanted to raise. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Who is it that's going to sit on the great white throne then? Who is the one before whom we are going to come in judgment? Jesus. But then aren't we being judged by the Father? Oh, yes. Jesus and the Father are one. But it's important to know that the one who died for you is also the one who will judge you. But continuing, he said, He has committed judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. Verily I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when all the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Don't marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which everyone in the grave shall hear his voice, the Son of Man, and shall come forth, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing. Nothing. Apart from the Father. It was that 
at oneness with the Father that gave Jesus the power to do what he had to do. But there is something else. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And that brings us to the second consideration of what it means to be at one with God. When you are at one with God, not only do you share in God's power, you share in His will. Your will and the Father's will must also become one. Otherwise, how could you say you are at one with God? What God wants, you want. What, God's are, what are God's goals? Are your goals. God's purposes are your purposes. Jesus gave us a beautiful illustration of that the night before he died. When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he asked his disciples to wait and he went off for some little distance and he began to pray. He was very heavy and very burdened that night. And he prayed, Father, if it be possible for this cup to pass from me, please. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He went back and found the disciples asleep, and he went back and he prayed again more earnestly this time when his sweat was like great drops of blood. And as he prayed, he came to a little different wording as he said, Father, not my will. If, if it is not your will that this cup pass from me, then your will be done. And he seemed to, his will seemed to merge with that of the Father through the process of prayer as he came to see it is God's will that I go through this. And he went back and prayed a third time the same way. And then finally he came to the disciples and said, Arise, let's be going. The man that betrays me is at hand. And he knew. And he had come to the place where his will and the Father's will were one. And he willed himself to die. He willed himself to make that final and ultimate sacrifice. And then we come to the third thing that it means to be at one with God. Not only can you share in his power, not only must you share in his will, you must also share in his sacrifice. There was a man named Abraham who was called a friend of God. And the Lord came to him on a day and said, Abraham, and he said, here am I, Lord. And he said, I want you to take your, only, your son Isaac, your only son, and I want you to take him to a place that I will show you and offer him there for a burnt offering. Now, if you think that that was, since Abraham had so much faith that that was easy for him, you are badly mistaken. That would have been just as painful for Abraham as it would have been for any one of you here. In fact, perhaps more so than most of us, for I think in selecting Abraham as the man to experience this, as the man to walk this out, as the man to be his friend, God selected a man who was sensitive enough to know what it meant to give up his own, his only son. And so Abraham took his son, and Abraham went, and Abraham of all the men in history is one man who has known what it meant to be God. He has actually experienced what it's like to make the sacrifice that God made. And of course, in this case, Jesus himself was involved in the sacrifice, for it was he who would voluntarily offer himself, not merely because the Father took him by the hand and took him to his place. And you have to understand that by the time Abraham was doing this with Isaac, Isaac was no little boy. He was not just three or four years old where he didn't know what was going on. He was a mature young man, and he did know what was going on. And Isaac went with his father so that Jesus, at one with the father, gave up that at oneness with God and came down to be in the flesh where man was and lived, in a sense, apart from the father in a way that he had not and voluntarily died as a sacrifice for our sins. You know, when you understand this, and you think in terms of what it really means to be at one with God, well, let us turn back again to John, the 15th chapter, where we were before. John chapter 15, and verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
This also is a part of what it means to be at one with God while we are here. That if they persecuted him, they will also persecute us, for we are like him. And you know, strangely as it may seem, the more we are like him, the more perhaps we open ourselves up to persecution, to op opposition, to suffering, and to loss. To be at one with Christ is to share in his suffering. It is to share in his shame. That if there are those who would ridicule Christ, then you must accept that ridicule yourself. You must be willing in the face of people who, are, who hate Christ not to be ashamed of him, but to be at one with him and to identify yourself with him and share in that persecution. It's part of it. And there are people by the hundreds and by the thousands who died horribly doing precisely that in the first generations of the church of God. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours. But we know how that worked. Then comes the 16th chapter. These things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. They're going to put you out of synagogues. The time will come that whoever kills you will think that he does God a service. You see, this is part of what it means to be at one with God, to share in his sacrifice, to share in his suffering. These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not to you at the beginning because I was with you. Then comes the promise of the comforter and the encouragement that he was going to give them. And then the beautiful 17th chapter of John, which is the real Lord's Prayer. In verse 1 where he says, These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. And down in verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them that you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are going to be in the world. And here is the big problem that they faced. Jesus would not be in the world. The Father would not be in the world. But all of the disciples and all of those that they preached to, like you and I who would eventually come along later, would still be in the world. He said, they're going to be in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep through your own name, by your own authority, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Now this prayer has, has to do with the time of the return of Christ and the resurrection are being made at one ultimately and finally and spiritually with God. But do you realize that this prayer was made for people who were alive on the earth and who would be living on the earth and for people who would be converted as a result of the preaching of these men. And the prayer was that they may be one, as we are one. It's really a powerful concept. And Jesus' prayer, once again, was for all of us to be at one with God, which once again sh involves the sharing of the sacrifice and the sharing of the suffering. And the second chapter of Hebrews is a very important development of the same theme. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And if Jesus was to be made perfect through sufferings and we are to be at one with him, is there another way for us to be made perfect? Us who are so imperfect to start with? For both he that sanctifies, that's Jesus, and they who are sanctified, that's us, are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. You know, it's a marvelous thing to realize this, this expression that, that Jesus is not ashamed of us. And you think of the times maybe in our lives when we've caught ourselves in a moment of weakness being ashamed of him. But he says, we, the one who is doing the sanctified, and you and I who are being sanctified, are all of a whole piece, all of one. He is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, 
I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, you can do a lot of thinking about this, but if we are to be at one with Christ in the flesh, while we are still here, to whatever degree a human being can be at one with God, it was absolutely necessary that Jesus Christ experience the flesh. It was necessary that he be human. It was necessary that he suffer human fear. It was necessary that he suffer human pain. It was necessary that he become acquainted with the things that, that you and I are afraid of. It was necessary that he face death and conquer the fear of death, overcome that fear which is upon every one of us, in order that when we become at one with him, that the fear of death would be conquered in us as well. We who all our lifetimes are subject to bondage because we're afraid to die. Jesus had to overcome it. And when you are at one with him, you will overcome it as well. For verily he took not upon himself the nature of angels. He took upon himself the nature of the children of Abraham, folks like us. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And that's the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, that day that pictures being made ultimately and finally in reality at one with God. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those people who are tempted. Do you suppose it's possible to be at one with God and be at odds with one another? How would that work? You know, you are at one with God. I am at one with God. How can we be at odds with one another? You know, whenever we find ourselves at odds with one another, chances are there's something wrong with our relationship to God. I know that when things are wrong with us, we are told to go to our brother. We're told to try to try to work those things out. And sometimes it seems like we try and it never seems to work, or it oftentimes doesn't seem to work, and we struggle, and we, or we don't feel like doing it. I wonder if maybe we ought not to give some little more thought to the fact that when things are not right between us and a brother, the things may not be right between us and God either. And it's time to give a little more attention to that. For we get things right with God, and when we are at one with Him, when we share in his goals, when we share in his will, when we're willing to share in his suffering, maybe, maybe we wouldn't find ourselves quite so hostile toward one another or quite so ready to, to struggle or fight with one another or bicker with one another over things of minor importance or even major importance. Paul wrote to the Philippians, If there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of the love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if there are any feelings, any mercies, Fulfill you, my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Boy, that runs contrary to the grain where human beings are concerned. For we hold independence. We hold identity. We hold these things that make us unique and separate from all other human beings so dear that we will oftentimes hold on to them in the face of continuing to even resist God. And the truth is, for us to be like-minded, for us to be one accord, for us to be like God, something has got to give somewhere. Some cherished opinion, some of our independence, some of our desire to go our own way, some of our want to stand alone for whatever it is, has got to go. For indeed, we are told that we cannot stand alone. Isn't that fundamental in Jesus' message? We cannot stand alone if you're cut off from me, you're withered, he said. And somebody comes around and gathers up all these branches that have been cut off and throws them in the fire, and they are burned. Without me, you can do nothing. You cannot stand alone. 
And if you are in Christ, you won't be alone as far as people are concerned either. For there will be others there. And where they, we are together in him, we have to be together with one another. To whatever degree we are not, we need to work on that. We need to take that to God. We need to spend some time in prayer with him and work a little harder at getting close to him. As long as you are alienated from your brother, if you can't be reconciled to your brother, at least you can make sure that you are reconciled to God. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each put the other ahead of himself. Don't look every man on his own things. Don't pursue your own interests, your own ideas to the exclusion of all else. Consider the things of others. Let this mind be in you. And that means a lot. It's a, it's a factor of allowing it to be there, not resisting it, not fighting it, not struggling with it, but accepting the mind of Christ and allowing it to be in you. The way that he thinks, the way that he forgives, the way that he endures, the way that he is long-suffering and patient with the foibles and the faults and the problems that other people have got. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, counted not equality with God something to be held on to, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He put pride in its proper place, and voluntarily, willingly, humbled himself, and being fashioned and found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When you went down the waters of baptism, having repented, and you came up, and God, you had received the laying on of hands, and God put his Holy Spirit in you, something happened there, and something very real, something very important. And from that day on until this one, in fact, even before that day, those, that will in you to obey God, that desire to obey God, that desire to know more about God, that desire to be closer to God, was put there by God himself. It is God in you that works to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is there, after all. And you are with God, after all. At one with him? Well, that comes and goes, doesn't it? The closeness, the awareness... The acceptance, the yielding, the obedience, those things kind of come and go from time to time in us, folks. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And whatever it is you're going to do, let's don't argue about it and let's don't bicker over it. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Boy, what a vision. There are people charging all around this world now trying to run some torch, clean around the world for something they believe in. And we have the real torch. We're the ones who really got a hold of that word of life that we can hold forth and, and run it around. Hold forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. There was a man who was at one with God. He said, if I, my life, whatever it is that I'm going to be doing, is offered upon the sac and in sacrifice upon the, your, uh, for your faith, to create your faith, then I'm happy. My life can be sacrificed for the sake of having all of you in the faith, he said, and I'm happy. This is a man who was at one with God, who was willing to give everything and to die in order that we might have life. You know, if indeed you are willing to share in the will of God. If you really are willing to share in it, to experience it, to have that will, to give up your will for his will, 
If you are willing to share in the sacrifice of God, if you're willing to suffer humiliation like he did, if necessary, for the faith, if you are willing to suffer loss for the sake of other Christians, as he did, if you're willing to give that ultimate sacrifice as he did, then you will be accounted worthy to share in the power of God and the glory of God. You, as a human being, mere mortal man, can come to be at one with God.